So welcome everybody. Um, we have about 50 participants joining us right now. This is our sixth CRC roundtable. It's a monthly seminar series um, hosted by the Chesapeake Research Consortium. I should also say that my name is Paula Jasinski and I am subbing today for Denise Wardrop, the Executive Director for CRC, who um, just had another obligation today. The intention of these webinars is to host targeted and inclusive conversations that match scientific advances and management needs. The webinars are designed for contribution, not consumption. That means that we want a diverse range of um, opinions and um, we want to hear from researchers, managers, and other professionals who have joined us today and have conversations around critical topics, including today's on sea level rise. The point of these webinars is to help build connectivity between all of us and increase our collective competency for decision making. As a reflection of that intent, the participants um, have each been given about 25 minutes in total to provide some introductory remarks, then allowing a full 30 minutes for us to have discussion afterwards. This is all about us and it's the collective us, everybody on this call today, giving us a place to ask some some of the clumsy questions around difficult topics sometimes, um, practice bravery and humility necessary for building the future that we want. Um, and this round table follows a webinar on connecting big, the big global issue of climate change and the Chesapeake Bay Partnership and how to best support communities in their goal of developing resiliency. So that was January's webinar. If you have not had a chance to see that, we can put that link in our chat so you can go back and review that one as well. This represents the kind of evolving conversations and learning that we hope that these forums will continue to support. I wanna mention that these webinars are recorded. Uh, and just like I, I mentioned, um, everything is available through the CRC website. If you want, want to review any of the past ones, please go and visit their site. Um, to kick off today and make sure that this is fully participatory and everybody knows who's who, please type your name and your organization and location into the chat box so everybody can see um, who's joined us today um, for the panel discussion. We also ask a couple of ground rules that you stay muted with your camera off while speakers are presenting. And um, that helps us with a better recording and just so everybody can see them highlighted. Uh, so today we start by asking why this topic and why this panel of speakers? Well, today's current events shine a light on the big problems around the struggles of how do we take the first steps um, on sea level rise, changes that have happened at every scale over the last month um, around climate change and climate resiliency. And sea level rise is definitely a, a large topic, um, and that's why this, this topic right now, um, why these speakers, much like the Chesapeake Bay itself, it's often those points of intersection that are most dynamic and interesting. And the land-water interface where freshwater meets saltwater, habitat connectivity, um, just like that, today's speakers really understand the power of working at these points of intersect from engineering and modeling and public policy and social science and really understanding how to address climate change and sea level rise and that that requires us to think and work outside of our traditional silos. So today's speakers are Dr. Ray Najjar. He's an oceanography professor at Penn State working at the intersect between coastal issues of eutrophication, hypoxia, sea level rise and more, uh, data analysis, modeling and remote sensing. Um, I liked reading his bio that he was inspired by some of the great science communicators of Rachel Car Carson, David Attenborough, and Carl Sagan, um, true leaders. And his work on understanding climate impacts was even included in the first national climate assessment. Uh, Dr. Wee Youssef is also joining us today. She's professor of public policy at the Strong College of Business at Old Dominion University. She's also assistant director for the Institutes for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, um, ODU's ICAR. Um, and she leads Virginia's Climate Adaptation and, and Resilience Program, which is jointly funded by ODU and Sea Grant. Um, and that program works closely with coastal communities to encourage the development and implementation of climate adaptation and hazard resilience planning and practices. Um, so she, uh, they're both going to walk us through some of their work and pose some questions to the group today. Uh, they're going to tag team the presentations, and then at the end, we'll tee up some discussion questions for all of you. And we're really excited to hear from all of you. So um, please feel free to join in the conversation once they're done. Um, these panelists have graciously um, agreed to give their time and their expertise today and condense it into the time allotted. So we're great, um, very greatly appreciative of that. Um, and I will certainly uh, try and make sure that we stay on time for this today to be respectful of everybody's lunch hour. 
So attendees, if we don't get to your questions during the webinar, um, we will give the speakers after, time afterwards to address them and send that out in a, um, information back to the community. So with that, I will turn it over to Ray uh, to begin the presentation. Okay, you can see my uh, see my first slide. Great. Well, yeah. hi everyone. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me for your um, lunch hour. Uh, it's nice to see some uh, familiar names there in the in the chat box. Um, I think I'll be able to refer some questions, tough questions I get to some of you, and uh, and um, I look forward to talking to you about sea level rise in Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is an area I learn about. Uh, mainly as a consumer of sea level rise information. I do maybe just a little bit of my own original research on, on sea level rise. It, it, mainly what I do is I use sea level rise information to uh, pursue some of my own research interests, which are really in the area of climate change impacts on uh, estuaries, including um, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, uh, I've, uh, since 2008, I've been working on uh, impacts of sea level rise on salinity of um, of estuaries, and uh, so that's sort of that's sort of my entry point into this. So I really won't be showing um, much of my own research except um, uh, at, at the very end. And in fact, I had to learn quite a lot um, to give this presentation, and I was very happy to because um, it's really um, uh, an exciting and very rapidly developing. Um, area, both globally and regionally. So I'm going to walk you through um, uh, uh, talking about um, uh, talking uh, first about a global picture of sea level rise, um, then uh, a, a more regional view, then look at some sea level projections for the Chesapeake, and then mostly mean sea level projections, and then talk a little bit about extremes in, in uh, sea level. So let's go to the global picture first. Um, as you know, sea level rise is, is, is occurring, but maybe you don't know that, that sea level is actually accelerating. And that's really shown very clearly in this graph, which shows how sea level rise rate has increased um, from the beginning of the 20th century and is almost like five or six times larger now than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And even within this last um, uh, sort of 30 year period, you can see it's kind of bending upward. And, and that's been used to estimate this acceleration estimate here um, on the right. And, and the global rise in sea level so far has been about, about 20, 20 centimeters. Um, uh, the, a lot of research has been done to try to figure out exactly why sea level is rising and, and um, sea level rise scientists talk about the global sea level budget. And the budget is basically balanced. Um, about 40% of it is, is of the sea level rises due to thermal expansion and the remainder um, can be accounted for by added water, mostly uh, from melting, uh, melting ice on Antarctica, Greenland and, um, and other glaciers. So we understand what's going on there. And, and another interesting thing is that the sea level rise that we're seeing now, okay, so this is over the last, I don't have a Y, a X axis here, sorry about this, but this is over the last uh, 2000 years or so. So here's, here's a zero, um, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, when, when Christ was born here, and this is the last 2000 years, and sea levels actually fluctuated quite a bit in this reconstruction. It's sort of a hockey stick diagram for sea level rise. Um, and I'm referring to my colleague Mike's, Mike Mann's work on, on temperature, which shows a long-term decline and then a rapid increase. And we kind of see a similar thing with sea level. And what's notable is that the last hundred years or so, the rate of sea level rise is really nothing like we've seen in the previous um, two millennia. And I've, I've sort of added this little bit myself the past um, uh, 20 years. So we're really in, in uncharted territory. Now, sea level rise is something that is not happening at the same rate everywhere. And I'm here talking about just the absolute uh, level of the sea. We'll get into relative sea level rise in, in a minute. But from satellite altimetry, that is, you know, bouncing radar waves off the sea surface and measuring how long it takes to come back, we're able to measure changes in the height of the sea surface. And that's what this map shows 
over the past about 30 years or so. And you can see that the rates vary quite a bit throughout, throughout the ocean. There's even some places where, where sea level is dropping. But of course, by just about everywhere, it's rising. And, and the pattern is, uh, is complicated. And it, it's related to the rate at which uh, heat is taken up in different areas of the ocean and how that heat and also fresh water is moved around by, by ocean currents. So that's kind of the global picture. Let's zoom in to the region here. And on the left, we have the sort of 100 year estimate of sea level rise rate along the US East Coast. And we have these relatively high rates of sea level rise in the Mid-Atlantic Bight, where the Chesapeake Bay is, and relatively low levels in the South Atlantic Bight and even lower in, in the Gulf of Maine. And that's sort of shown here. This is actually a modeling study that ingests a lot of sea level and other kinds of data to try to figure that out. I'm sorry, that's right up here. So it shows the relatively high sea level rates in the Mid-Atlantic Bight and lower elsewhere. And that pattern here is pretty much due to the variations of vertical land movements. So here we're talking about relative sea level rise because the land moves as well as the ocean. And of course, we care about the difference, the relative rate. Um, and uh, so what's happening is that these negative values in indicate that the land is sinking in the South Atlantic Bight and Mid-Atlantic Bight, not really changing so much in the Gulf of Maine. And that accounts for that pattern. And that's well known what that's due to. This is a nice uh, uh, cartoon from John Boone's report about sea level rise. And it's showing the ice sheet pushing down, um, the Laurentide ice sheet pushing down and creating this four bulge. Uh, that when it the ice melts, the four bulge declines, and we have we have subsidence. So um, uh, let's get back to the acceleration issue. Um, sea level rise. Here's the global rate here, and these are all sites along the U.S. East Coast from Maine down to Key West, Florida. And you can see that the acceleration of sea level, that curvature is generally higher along the East Coast than the global average. And we have particularly high rates sort of between the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic by the so-called hotspot of, of uh, sea level rise. Um, another factor that's, that's um, affecting ocean currents, this is very nice work done by Tal Ezer. I'm sorry, I don't have his... Um, his, his name listed here, but this is a cartoon summarizing, uh, you know, at least a decade of his really excellent work on how ocean currents and heating of the ocean have influenced uh, coastal, coastal sea levels. So uh, changes in winds can affect the Gulf Stream that drive changes in coastal sea level. And this cartoon here shows kind of a cross section across the Gulf Stream here such that when the Gulf Stream is strong, it's a very steep drop off to the coast. Um, and when the Gulf Stream is weak, that uh, drop off is less and, and the sea level actually rises. So variations in the Gulf Stream can affect uh, coastal sea level. And he also points out here that changes in the rate at which the subtropical gyre warms can also influence and very, uh, counterintuitive ways uh, sea level in the um, in the mid-Atlantic bite. So ocean dynamics also figures into perhaps some of this acceleration that's occurring along the U.S. East Coast and how it may be sh shifting from place to place. So let's take a look at some projections for the um, for the Chesapeake, um, and this is from a, a very nice report by John Boone and others uh, showing uh, a sea level um, at at uh, Norfolk, Virginia here. And, and they uh, quantify this acceleration and, and extrapolation of that um, to 2050 gives a sea level rise of about a half a meter. And if you take a linear extrapolation, you get a much smaller sea level rise of 0.3 meters. So this is one way to make projections is simply to extrapolate the data. And what John Boone and others have pointed out is that it's really important to account for that acceleration. Um, another approach is to use a model uh, that ingests data and, and uses climate model projections. And this is work by Bob Kopp and others from 2014 as reported in um, a Maryland report about sea level rise. And 
And, and they account for um, ice sheet melting, ocean warming, ocean dynamics, even land water change, and some of these non climate effects like this, um, this isostatic rebound from the glaciers, the tectonic effects. I mean, I guess it's ultimately climatic, but it's not related to the current warming. And the main point here, you can see the relative sea level rise now in feet. Okay, so we've changed units, keep that in mind. And, and the advance of this work is to give probabilities for different amounts of sea level rise under different emissions scenarios. And I would say the main point of this figure is that man, the impacts are large. So we're in for some very large changes in sea level in the Chesapeake and many and many other regions. There's, there's, still, there's quite a range of, of possibilities. Um, and, uh, but, but you also see the importance of emissions, particularly as you get out towards the end of the century where the difference from a kind of a Paris Agreement scenario um, to uh, kind of business as usual is maybe maybe a factor or two or, or maybe a little bit less. Um, check my time there. Okay, I'm winding down. So um, so uh, another point that's made in, in in this report by Bosch is that there's not a lot of spatial variability uh, within the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Norfolk has a little bit more subsidence than other parts of the bay, so sea level rise there is a little bit larger, but otherwise most of the other factors don't vary throughout the bay. Let's just talk a little bit about changes in extremes. And this is another area that's really evolving rapidly is that uh, hurricanes are, are, are changing quite a bit. Um, they're becoming more extreme. So the fraction of global hurricanes that are major, that is category three to five is going up and, and quite, quite significantly. So this is relatively new research. Another thing we're learning about hurricanes is that the fraction of them that come close to the coast is increasing as well. So these are two uh, things that are going to make um, uh, flooding worse in, in coastal areas. So here's a summary. It looks like I don't have time to go through it. Um, but, the, but the bottom line is that observations theory and models um, show with increasing robustness that there's going to be it, it, rising global tropical cyclone risk. And, and they go through the different elements of that with, with different levels of um, uh, confidence here in this nice paper by Tom Knudsen. And then finally, here's some of my own work with Andrew Ross showing that the tidal range um, is changing in Chesapeake Bay. We've known that for quite a while, but what Andrew found out is that a lot of the pattern that we observe in the change in tidal range, the difference between the high and the low, is actually due to sea level rise itself. And that's what's shown in red here. The part of that change in, 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 in the tidal range that's due to sea level rise itself. And it affects the speed at which the tidal wave travels throughout the bay, and that leads to changes in in tidal range. So to summarize, um, global sea level is accelerating due to thermal expansion and ice melting. There are spatial variations that are due to land movement. Um, we have a large acceleration along the US East Coast. Uh, the projections of Chesapeake sea level are large and, and they emphasize the importance of emissions. Um, we, uh, we also learned that tropical cyclones are, are something that we need to consider in the future in terms of the extremes going up. And that tidal range is something that we also should probably pay attention to. So I think I'm a minute over, sorry about that. Um, that was tough to do. Um, I, I hope it uh, will pro provide some fodder for uh, discussion. Thank you. That's great, Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, I know it was a lot of information for you to squeeze into that a small amount of time. So next up, um, we'll have Dr. Yusuf share her slides. Um, one thing I didn't mention while she's teeing hers up is if you're not following her on Twitter, please do. She's got the best handle ever of We Rockstar. So it's right there. I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. So can everybody see my screen? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so Ray did a great job on the science side. Um, I work with oceanographers, engineers, um, modelers here at ODU, but I am not a more technical person. I'm very much a behaviorist. Um, and so what I want to kind of focus today is when we are thinking about sea level rise and flooding, really looking at a people-centered perspective of the impacts and then thinking about how we put people at the center of this conversation about sea level rise and flooding. 
So um, my plan originally was to kind of tee off of Ray's um, presentation to start with kind of um, some of the impacts, um, what's at risk, starting with saltwater intrusion and the effects on farmland, uh, agriculture, and, um, and even forests. Then thinking about land inundation and shoreline erosion, uh, sea level rise and flooding have caused damage, destruction to wetlands. We're now facing, and we've seen this just in, in the last year with increased threats from severe storms, so rainstorms, tropical storms, and, and hurricanes. But the impacts of sea level rise, when you think about it from a daily person perspective, um, we're really seeing it in terms of the daily life and the challenges of living in the coastal zone in terms of increases in property insurance, effects on uh, property values, effects on transportation and infrastructure, and even economic stability. So I'll go into this a little bit more. But I think what's really important to, to recognize is that the impacts of sea level rise and the flood impacts really vary uh, depending on the types of the communities and their location. So when we think about, for example, more rural communities that might be agricultural or farm-based, saltwater intrusion can have an effect on um, you know, the chemistry of the soil and then have an impact on the economic base and the livelihood of these communities. But then we might turn um, to more urban areas and you see the impact of flooding and kind of sewer <laughs> overflows um, that cause problems for water quality, um, just, you know, health and, and hygiene issues. And in the more rural communities, issues with septic systems leaking, um, becoming inoperable because of um, more extensive flooding. Across the communities, um, those homes in lower lying areas, you see expected as expected flooded homes or homes that would have to be built higher up or elevated. Um, and shoreline, shoreline erosion has a variety of impacts depending on the types or the nature of the community in terms of thinking about property values, um, thinking about damage to the infrastructure, um, you know, roads being, being washed away. Uh, and also for communities that might be more tourism reliant, uh, an, eff an effect on the economic base of these particular communities. So you see also across rural, suburban, urban communities, flooded roads that impinge the ability to get from point A to point B. Um, my colleagues and I are currently doing some work here in Portsmouth, Virginia, looking at how can we quantify the economic impact of lost productivity when people are challenged in getting to work or the loss of educational time when kids are late getting to school and the ripple effects of those on kind of implications for daily life. And, and as I just, just mentioned, you know, severe, uh, the, th the threats of storm surge also uh, vary depending on the nature of the community. More importantly, um, when you think about the contributors of flooding, um, they're multi-pronged, right? When we think about storm surge associated with a storm, that's a very different impact. But when you couple that with rising tides and higher water levels because of sea level rise, um, and then you might think about in terms of how increased precipitation interacts with the built environment, um, with aging stormwater infrastructure across a lot of communities, um, poor road drainage that causes a lot more of the flooding. And then you think about how that then further interacts with surface runoff that further exacerbates the, the inundation and, and the flooding. So there are a variety of, of different sources of, of the problem. And so part of the reason why we talk about urban flooding, sea level rise, coastal resilience as a wicked problem is because there is no one particular solution because the root causes are multifaceted and also that uh, the required changes in behavior. Remember at heart, I'm a behaviorist. So that's what I really care about. What are the behavioral effects um, of, of these challenges and these issues? And when you think about addressing the problem from a behavioral perspective, these require different behavioral responses. So thinking more comprehensively about sea level rise impacts and kind of what we need to think about in terms of adapting to flooding requires thinking about them from that multi-pronged perspective. But at the end of the day, the human dimension is always at the heart of thinking about the impacts of the problem and how we would address that problem in the, long, in the shorter term, medium term, and in the longer term. Um, regardless of where you live, if you are in, um, you know, an area affected by sea level rise, all of the communities will affect road flooding in some shape or form. 
road flooding essentially is everywhere. And in the work that, that I do with my colleagues, one of our starting points for really studying the behavioral dimensions of flooding was really looking at how are drivers reacting to an impacted by flooding. Um, so these are just some, uh, some quotes from the drivers that we interacted with as we're trying to get a better handle on how are they dealing with flooding? How is the flooding impacted them in getting from point A to point B? Um, and one in particular um, that always strikes me that I like to, ca to, to, to call out is um, one of our graduate students who talked about he would get text messages in the morning warning him that roads are starting to get flooded. And for him, I always just take this as, you know, let's start, start the adventure figuring out what road to take to get from point A to point B. Uh, similarly, um, the National Weather Service does a great job at um, the messaging in terms of turn around, don't drown. Um, but my students uh, will sometimes comment about, well, if I turn around every time I encounter water here in Norfolk, I'm never going to get outside of my neighborhood. Um, so you're seeing kind of these ripple effects of impacts in terms of how people deal with flooding on, on the roads, but also in terms of how they decide to adapt. And so one person um, talks about, you know, needing, feeling pressured into buying vehicles that are ha higher clearance so that they can make it through, make it through flooding. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that flooding, you know, flooding, flooded, flooding on the roads has a ripple effect on kind of the daily life of people. And yet when you turn around, we're always hearing about talk about a new app to solve this or a new app to deal with that. And here in the region, um, I've heard many, many times people talking about, well, we'll build an app to help people navigate flooding from point A to point B. But what we're generally missing is a consideration of how do we deal with uh, solutions that are driver centric, centered, right? That are centric to the person. And, and really the fundamental issue here is to design effective tools to help drivers navigate flooded roads, we need, we need information about the drivers themselves. It's not just about what technologically we can do. We might have the best mapping software and the best technology to develop an app, but if it doesn't resonate with how drivers would use a tool or what drivers want in a tool or in an app, we're not gonna solve the problem. We're not gonna be adding value to drivers and how they deal with flooding on the roads. Um, so my colleagues and I went out and talked to a, a bunch of drivers to figure out what are we talking about when we're, where we're considering uh, the needs of these drivers. And obviously, as my gut instinct was telling me, there is no one size fits all solution. As we're talking to different drivers, we recognize that there are different profiles of drivers who would use a tool or an app um, that you would need to kind of factor into that any decision about design. So we identified three dimensions. One was how these drivers might search for information. If they're an expert searcher versus someone who might more actively search um, given specific needs or given specific circumstances, that might dictate how useful and how readily available the tool would need to be. Alternatively, as in many communities, there are some people who only receive information and use the information to act for themselves or for their immediate family. There are others who have a very central role within their network of family and friends, and they play a dissemination role. And there then, how they would use this app could be very different in terms of if it's only for my consumption or if it is for me to help disseminate that. And recognizing what tools would be helpful for disseminators also then helps in terms of having a broader reach for a specific tool or for a specific solution and then the timing dimension of response and action. Um, some people are proactive and they're trying to plan ahead a day or two. Um, so they might want to know more about future flooding, whereas rather others are much more reactive and want to, to know information about real-time flooding while they're driving on the road. One tool might not be able to meet both proactive and reactive needs um, and selling or, or, or Characterizing a tool as being able to do so, I think would challenge the utilization of that particular tool. And so our research here has really showed that when we're talking about solution, we really need to kind of center them within um, the people who are using uh, these particular tools. And I have one more minute, so I just wanna wrap up very quickly. 
um, by making the point that with a lot of our research has focused on the impacts of flooding. Um, but one of the things that we're really grappling with is this issue that the problem isn't just the amount of water. Yes, the amount of water is challenging, for example, in terms of road flooding of getting people from point A to point B. So flooding does have to do with the quantity of water, but it's also about the quality of water. And so when you think about um, how we deal with flooding, we not just, I, I think part of the struggle, and this is my last slide, I promise, um, when we're dealing with how do we address the imp reducing the impact and how do we get people at the heart of this conversation, we need to figure out, do people actually understand the quantity and the quality dimensions of flooding? And how do we help people, people who might support a policy, who might be using an app, might be using a tool, how do we help them reconcile the quantity and quality dimensions of flooding? Thank you. Thank you both. Um, really interesting presentations and, and I can't thank you all enough for joining us today. There've been um, a couple of questions already in the chat um, and I invite others to please post yours there. Um, you can also um, ask it in person if you'd like, just let us know that. Um, from Ann Pascucci at Christopher Newport, she said this conversation seems like an, a great opportunity to communicate the cost of climate change to people and the workarounds may be actually adding to the problem we, as you sort of noted. Um, so is there a long-term educational opportunity um, about how we can have an impact? Any thoughts uh, on that? It, Ray, do you want to try and answer that? <laughs> um, no, why don't, why don't you go ahead? I think you have something. <laughs> I, yeah. I, the, the, as a behaviorist, I, I've always been of the opinion that kind of education is at the heart of it. Um, but I will also say that sometimes part of the challenge is um, in educating is really getting the issues to resonate with the people at the right time and with the right content or the right format, right? And, and so, you know, Ray did a great job kind of underlying the underlining kind of the science behind all of this. And I think that science understanding is as critical for people to understand that, for example, this is not a problem that's going to go away immediately. And so realistically, we shouldn't be thinking about, you know, short term, quick fix solutions. Um, simultaneously, this is not a very easy problem to convey because the problems, the what, how they manifest are immediate. It's flooding, it's raining, oh, the roads are gonna flood, right? Or a storm is coming, we know it's gonna be bad, we're gonna have to evacuate. So the, there's an immediacy to it that gut instinct also, then you want to deal with the immediate challenges rather than thinking about the long-term solutions. Um, so education, I think, has to balance. Um, they, the issues resonate with us because they're immediate, but we can't just deal with it one time and, and say, we're good to go. Great point. Ray, did you want to add anything? Well, I think is it's going, it's really challenging because um, so much climate change is already in the system. And, and things, so the adaptation part is really where we can make a difference and, and have people notice impacts. But we really need to get our emissions down. The thing is, we're not gonna see the impacts of, of those emissions reductions, um, except, for, except for some kind of uh, side um, issues like air pollution. We'll see immediate impacts on, on air quality by reducing fossil fuel emissions, but the climate impacts are going to take a while to feel. So that that is really very challenging. I think we've even forgot about forgotten about the incredible progress we've made with air pollution in this in this country. Um, so it, so if we can't get that, I, I think the climate the climate one is is super challenging. So we really need leadership at the federal level and all the different levels throughout the government to get us there, to have a long, long-term uh, view of this. Yeah, good. Uh, we also got another question from Karen Metchis. Um, we, what communities are good examples of how to build resilience to flooding? 
Um, there are lots of different communities that I think have done a good job in different ways. And so when we think about resilience to flooding, um, I don't know that any community has really kind of been able to tackle the multi multiple dimensions of it. But just here in um, the Hampton Roads area, for example, you know, the city of Virginia Beach has done a much a, a pretty a really good job at more comprehensively thinking about sea level rise and recurrent flooding and a, a approaching kind of their resilience planning from a multifaceted perspective. So they're looking at structural solutions. There are just some areas where without structural solutions um, that you cannot reduce the risk to flooding. But they're also looking at natural and nature-based solutions such as green infrastructure, um, you know, rain gardens, a variety of more natural soft green solutions uh, to mitigate, to, to address some of the flooding impacts as well. They're also looking at it from a policy perspective in terms of changes in building codes or construction standards, um, you, you know, um, limits on development and where development can be, implementing voluntary property buyouts. So they're looking at it from a multifaceted perspective. And I think that's really what, what are good examples is not just saying we're going to elevate roads or we're going to get elevate homes, but looking at that problem from multiple perspectives, from a policy perspective. But more importantly, I think we need to kind of help residents understand that government alone can't solve the problem, right? And that there are some things that as property owners, as members of the community, I can do we can do to harden our homes or protect our homes as well. So that multifaceted involves not just different approaches to the problem, but different ways that different actors can address the problem. Great. Um, let's see, we got another question also probably for we, but can you talk a little bit more? What, what do you mean specifically about the quality of water that you mentioned that it's quantity and quality? So, um, it's probably a little too much to pull up my, pull up my slide again, but it's it's nutrients in the water, it's pollution, it's litter and detritus. It's just a variety of different things um, because I part of part of the challenge is we get we we get stuck on there's just so much water, and here um, this always this always resonates with me when it starts flooding. We have we have flooding. On the TV news shows, they'll always show pictures of people or kids in their kayaks or on paddle boards um, in the middle of flooding, you know, in one of the neighborhoods. And that just makes my heart go, ugh, because I'm thinking, do you know what's in the water? <laughs> right? So, so, so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of contaminants, it's the nutrients, it's runoff from urban areas, just thinking about what flows from your road into the water, I think is a really good way to think about what, what we're talking about when we talk about water quality. Yeah, it's good to make that connection. Um, and then uh, let's see, Andrea Rocio, um, would there possibly be a future in a place like Hampton Roads to have a better commuter system and ways of transportation to cut down on fossil fuel emissions um, and also get people safely from point A to B during flooding events? I'm an optimist. I think there's always possibilities, um, but sometimes I think the challenge is that we do not in, we don't always integrate our planning. So, for example, our capital planning and a, our transportation planning with these resilience features. Um, I live in Norfolk, and not we we put in a light rail system about 10, 11 years ago. But the light rail system was part of that capital planning process was put in place where existing rail lines were already in place in low-lying areas. So we have a great light rail system to get people out of their cars, <laughs> but when it floods, um, that might have an impact on getting people from point A um, to point B. I, I think this is, again, uh, part of thinking about flooding um, and, and thinking about different modes of transportation, maybe from a more complete streets perspective, bicycles, walking, um, ride sharing, public transit, um, but, you know, recognizing also how do we in incorporate getting people safely where to where they want to be during during a flood event. Yeah. 
Um, there are several other questions in the chat box, but Ray, I also wanted to ask you, um, since you were talking about the data and you really teed up the science, if you are a decision maker in Hanson Roads or somewhere else, where would you point them to the best source of data? Uh, about uh, projections for flooding? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I mean, to prepare. Yeah, the, the, the states of Maryland and, and Virginia have done a great job with um, providing, you know, basically pulling the regional scientists together for writing reports about sea level rise and sea, and sea level uh, projections. The Maryland report is really excellent. And, um, and, and so there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of knowledge um, uh, from physical and social scientists in the area. So there are groups assembled um, to help. Um, there's also resources available at the national level, uh, Climate Central has good um, a, a visualization for and estimates for um, coastal flooding. NOAA has a sea level rise viewer. Mm -hmm. One thing that that these that these products aren't considering right now, to my knowledge, is changes in 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 storminess. So they're looking at sea level changes, but sort of things I talked about at the end. Um, which are how are tropical cyclones going to change? I didn't even talk about things like nor'easters, but how, you know, how are these extremes going to change? That's that's more challenging, and that's more mm -hmm. kind of cutting edge um, research. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, David Jasinski, what's the message for affected citizens? Um, is it a global problem, and if so, what's everybody's role in the solution? We, I know you, you talked a little bit about that before. Would either of you have anything to add? If you're a citizen, what, what should you be doing about this? So, so Ray had started talking more kind of about, about mitigation because I think the, you know, mitigation is, is very much the global problem. And what we can do to adapt is very much kind of more the bandages to kind of how we maintain the way of life that we currently have. Um, the challenge sometimes that, that we run into with the mitigation message is the question of self-efficacy, right? It's that I'm one person, what can one person do? Um, so, so it is sometimes I think a little bit challenging to speak about, to speak because, you know, because because it is such a global problem, you think, well, what what can one person what what can one person do? But here, I think it is that that whole picture story to be told that everybody plays a role, um, not just individuals but institutions, government, businesses, nonprofits. Um, but I think the other part of it is that we can only adapt so much, and I think that's sometimes something we don't want to say out loud <laughs> is that we can only adapt so much and there are going to be a time where we adaptation is only going to get us so far um so you you, you know i i think the challenge is you have to keep your eye on multiple prizes one is how do we maintain our daily living in in the current environment but the second is if we don't address emissions and other energy and fossil fuels and a variety of other climate contributing issues, you, you, you know, we're the the challenge become the challenges to daily life become a lot harder. So there are multiple end goals, and sometimes it's hard in, within you know an individual span of attention to focus on it simultaneously. Yeah, I'll add that I think it's good to remind people that there's a there's two things I would say. There's a lot of opportunities that climate change is bringing to kind of remake our energy infrastructure. That it, it, it'll be much cleaner. It'll our air quality will go up. I mean, there's huge benefits just from the improvements in in air quality. You can forget about climate change, and it just makes a ton of sense to transition to renewable energy. And and there's a lot of good jobs in that. So if we do it right and we take care of the people in the fossil, the workers in the fossil fuel industry that have taken care of us for so many years, make sure that they can transition to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to a, a, a economy that serves everybody, you know, in a new energy uh, economy, then I, I, I think that's, that, that's very powerful. 
and has a lot of possibility. So that's the first point, is opportunity. The second point is that we often forget that we've been extremely successful at solving some environmental problems in the past. And, and air quality is an example, even though it's still killing lots of people. It used to be a lot worse, especially in the United States. We've had spectacular improvements in air quality, even in water quality. In some places, we've even though we still have problems, we have seen very uh, uh, dramatic improvements in water quality in many places. Another example is the ozone hole, right? That's basically filling in now because of our international agreements. So we can do this and, 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 and we'll save money by doing it. So it's not like we, we're gonna have to suffer. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of inertia in the system. And there's a lot of people in the system now that have vested interests, you know, very powerful people that want to keep the status quo, but it's not good for everybody. It's not good for most people. And, and, and that's the message we've got to communicate. We'll be better off, way better off if we, if we tackle this problem. Great answers. Um, okay. Um, let's see, there's one more, or actually there's many more. Um, this one is from Stephanie um, Scholart, uh, um, and I might have mispronounced that, so I apologize, but is anything being done to protect or reinforce the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, um, or even building an alternative in case of, of extreme weather events? That is a great question, and I do not know the answer to. Um, I, I know that we're already kind of doing construction to expand it, but I don't know how much of the current work takes into consideration um, kind of, you know, exacerbated flooding, greater inundation and sea level rise. Um, but related to that point, I think Deborah had asked a question about the Bay Bridge and, and tunnel. And I think one of the things that I, the key point that I wanted to make is that this is, in much more recent years, we've seen this on the radar of planning departments and departments of transportation that they are now recognizing and incorporating sea level rise projections as they plan out for these mega projects and um, for transportation projects over, over the longer run. So we're seeing a lot more elevation projects. Um, sometimes though, I think because it takes so long from project planning and design to project construction initiation, things might go, might go awry periodically, but it is definitely on their radar. Good. Um, let's see, some of these, I think we've already addressed in different um, other questions. Travis Ostrom asked, can you discuss the trends of projections in groundwater table rise related to sea level rise? And are there some locations more or less susceptible around the Bay region? I don't know enough of the uh, specifics about that. I know it's an issue, but um, I don't know the details. Uh, I bet there are people <laughs> that are attending do, or maybe we, maybe you have some um, uh, knowledge about groundwater uh, projections. Um, I, I think there might be other people in the audience um, who would have more information about that than I do. I can tell you about uh, salinity change in the estuary itself, and that that that's my own um, research, and 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 we've made mm -hmm. estimates of how much has occurred and how much will occur in the future. But this is a different question, and maybe more important question because it it probably has a more direct impact on on drinking water supplies. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like either that's a that's a field ripe for research, or we just need to tie into who's doing that. Yeah. Um, and that might be a nice topic for an upcoming webinar um, to address this even further. Um, I wanna call out that um, Kirk Havens of them is reminding everybody they can go to adaptva.org for comprehensive information for Virginia communities. And then um, C. Jones, uh, does anyone have any experience with waterfront property owners wanting to fill in their properties uh, more due to sea level rise and flooding? Um, and he works with communities in Maryland or homeowners, and we're seeing more requests like that. Um, and that, of course, butts up against some of the, our coastal policy regulations and the advice we've been giving people before. Um, do either of you work with those, those kinds of requests? That's all kind of out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> Me too, but maybe there's someone yeah. in the audience who 
knows and will volunteer, right? That's the power of these yeah. things, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody want to raise their hand if they have knowledge about that? Oh, Ann. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm Andy Sirkeets from Gloucester, Virginia, and I know um, we are getting more requests for that. And um, I believe that uh, Doug at Hodges and, and the General Assembly have been looking at, they call it the soggy socks legislation, but like allowing a certain amount of fill, um, which normally would not be allowed to help protect properties. I don't know where it is in the General Assembly, but that is something that was considered for the, you know, the very reason of the sea level rise and um, impacting waterfront properties. So it is a big problem. Good. Thank you for sharing that, Ann. Um, I love the soggy socks name. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, there's um, someone else that shared uh, a changing Chesapeake link um, with information. Um, Julie from DCR, I think. Uh, so Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation working on Flood Awareness Week, um, March 14th through 20th. We're asking people to share their flood stories um, through that site. So that's sort of the stakeholder engagement and citizen science sort of light of sharing some of those impacts, which is really powerful. Um, uh, let's see, uh, some of the other questions you've already, you've already talked about, but um, a couple of questions that we'd like to ask all of our speakers. I know we're getting close to the end time here, but what keeps you up at night? about this topic um, and the next steps, what's, what's needed? Um, I guess what worries me is just, is that, um, is that it's just hard to, to communicate facts anymore. I mean, you know, it's just a problem with everything. So that, th that really worries me that we, we have all the science at our disposal. We have solutions, but you know, there's misinformation out there. Uh, there's people with with uh, agendas that are, you know, are not serving um, serving the most people. You know, and uh, th that's really what worries me. It's and that's something that is not just particular to climate change. So that's kind of what I really worry about. Yeah. I think for me, it's it, if we just look at the current landscape, is that there are so many competing issues that are pulling people um, in different directions that are requiring responses or that are taking you know our limited mental capacity to deal with a variety of issues. And so when you think about you know, I'm not saying coastal flooding isn't isn't important, but it kind of goes back to some of the messaging and, and what is what is it the story that that we tell when with the pandemic people are struggling with employment or underemployment, with you know, maintaining homes. Where do issues like this that if we don't address now will not go away? How do we get these issues to continue to resonate when even legislatures are are putting this as a lower priority because they have to deal with education and transportation and social services. I it just, you know, there's so many competing issues mm -hmm. um, that that something that I've always that I continue to struggle with is how do we continue to make this an issue that that resonates with people? Yeah, and um, we just because I, I know you deal with stakeholders and residents so often. Um, have you found any effective ways to engage the most vulnerable communities in this topic? Because, like you said, I know they're struggling with a lot right now. Um, but sea level rise and climate change will be other stressors for them. And and so really for us, it's been connecting this issue with other things that affect them. So, for example, when we think about hurricane season coming, how do we help them prepare? for a hurricane while linking that to these broader issues. Again, it goes back to what, what they can do in small bites and small chunks. <clears throat> but also what, what what's, I think excites me though is also the opportunity to use this as a, a learning opportunity for kids. So for example, one of the things that we've done is in a civics 101 program, 
used climate change and sea level rise as an opportunity for kids to learn about a policy issue, but then learn about how their government operates and how does that, how do they engage about a policy issue like sea level rise or flooding with their civic leaders. So kind of combining it with other things that are important to these vulnerable populations as kind of a tie-in, mm -hmm. maybe not the major thrust because it's really hard to get their attention on these issues when there are so many other competing concerns. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I know we're almost at time. Are there any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand um, or share it in the chat if there are any other questions. I do want to remind everybody that these presentations are recorded. Um, they will be available on the Chesapeake Research site, the um, chesapeake.org is their website. Um, so please go there if you've missed anything. For any questions that we might have missed, we'll also follow up with the speakers. So again, feel free to enter them in the chat um, and we can follow up with them and send, send that information back out to everybody that's registered. I uh, also want to remind people that our next web roundtable will be March 17th. Um, and we're looking, always looking for suggestions on topics for that. So it's another thing you can enter into the chat box. If you've got a topic that you would love to hear people address um, in this roundtable style, please, please let us know. We're always open to those. And then I'll, I'll um, maybe hand the mic back to the speakers. Are there any closing remarks or any final comments you all would like to add? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think I've made my made my main points. I just want to thank everyone for listening in. And I'm yeah, happy well, thank to you. engage further. If folks have, want to contact me um, separately, they look me up and email me. I'm happy to talk. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, it's been a really valuable discussion. I know the chat box has been very busy. Um, we've gotten lots of interesting questions and it's a, it's a topic that's not going away. So we appreciate all of your insight on this. Um, okay. Well, thank you everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today and have a great rest of your week.